Okay, uh, so well, I'll talk about um, smell loss in general, how common it is, and then in proportion to that, how common head injury related smell loss is. Um, I'll talk through some of the mechanisms for injury, um, how we assess and investigate people clinically, um, options for management, and also prognosis. So um, smell loss in general um, is thought to affect at least 1% of the population, maybe closer to 5% of the population have anosmia, so complete loss of smell. Um, but um, those with reduced sense of smell may now be uh, over 20% of the population. So these things are common. And actually, if you look at that in context of other sensory losses, so hearing loss and uh, sight loss, then it's at least as common as profound hearing loss and blindness, if you look at the... Uh, the UK figures. Um, so we're, we're sort of at least an equivalence with those other sensory losses. Um, there are a number of studies been done looking at sort of how common smell loss is around uh, various countries and, and the w different ways of sort of trying to approach that question. And so there are, there are varying reports between 1.4 and 15% uh, depending on the methods uh, used. Um, but um, smell dysfunction is some form, as I say, if you include a reduced sense of smell and distortions of smell uh, is, you know, at least probably sort of, you know, getting over the 20% mark. <clears throat> if you look at um, surveys that have been done specifically, then look at the sort of causes that come up in these surveys, um, then sinus disease always comes uh, top uh, with viruses uh, next. Um, uh, cases with no cause found as third, and then head injury tends to be sort of the fourth most common. Um, but as we allude to further on, that some of that may be underestimated. And in fact, it was the uh, the Spanish study that was conducted in Barcelona back in 2012 that showed that uh, uh, previous head injury was in, indeed a risk factor for a poor sense of smell. So I think I've covered this one already. So if we look at the Royal National Institutes for, for Blind and for Deafness, you can see that the the equivalence of other sensory losses. Um, this was a, a survey looking at um, uh, hospitals uh, um, and looking at people coming in with smell loss uh, in ENT clinics across the three German speaking nations of uh, Germany, Switzerland and Austria and uh, uh, looking at the common causes and uh, for those who don't speak German you'll see that the uh, Schadel hand trauma one is the one that hates the head injury, which is sort of the 5% uh, bar of the, uh, the pie chart. And so the biggest bits of the pie chart relate to um, various sort of problems inside the nose, such as sinus disease that tend to be the most common causes. Um, from my point of view, sort of seeing patients in a UK sort of setting in a specialist clinic, uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the uh, second tallest bar from the right uh, PTOL here is uh, stands for post-traumatic olfactory loss and that's the head injury group so they, it is one of the most common groups that I see come to clinic. So um, how common uh, is sort of head injury related smell loss uh, more generally? So if you look at head injury clinics so people are seen after sort of in the aftermath of having suffering head injuries and it's probably two to twelve percent of patients reporting uh, smell disturbances uh, and you look at smell and taste connects like mine, then it's sort of uh, up, up to sort of 20% of the cases of people presenting with um, smell loss after head injury. Um, often people with mild injuries may not realise they've got um, uh, smell loss initially, and, and sometimes these things are sort of are overlooked initially. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got people who maybe due to the severity of injuries, um, but they've got multiple injuries. And one of the, one of the common features is that people will... Uh, lose consciousness, be admitted to hospital, perhaps have a protracted period on intensive care unit uh, um, where they're unconscious. Uh, and, and they may not therefore realise, um, due to other things being focused on, that, that um, smell and perhaps taste disturbances have been affected. Um, and one of the things I hear most commonly is that people say to me, well, I just assumed that the hospital food was truly awful and therefore that was the reason I couldn't taste anything uh, while I was recovering on the ward. And of course, it's only when they get home and they uh, eat some good home cooked food, they realise even the home cooked food is uh, still pretty bland. So what are the demographics that we see? Um, so it's typically the young people that are affected by sports injuries and, and assaults and older people that um, uh, suffer falls and car accidents. Of course, they're not exclusive and, and we, we see a few people cross over into both. Um, uh, but certainly, you know, one in three 
uh, motor vehicle accidents involve sort of injuries to the head and neck region. So one of the key things about um, how uh, head injury or how trauma might impact upon smell and possibly taste depends to a degree on the mechanism of injury. So obviously you can get high impact injuries such as a car accident where you're thrown forwards and the, the head uh, is thrown forward. And obviously, depending on the individual car, there may be an airbag that goes off. Um, there may be direct contact with, um, with the steering wheel. Um, uh, obviously, if the, the car is buckled, that may sort of, you know, impact things as well. Um, if you've got low impact injuries that may be sort of fall over and a bang to the back of the head, uh, may seem low impact at the time, but that, that's another common sort of, uh, sort of it's a method of injury that we see. Um, obviously, if there's an associated facial injury, so a, a, a sort of a, a blow to the nose as well as um, more generally to the head, may of course cause some trauma that affects the nasal um, shape um, and particularly the nasal septum, which is the bit of cartilage and bone that separates the nose in two halves. And of course, if that's fractured, um, that can have an impact on the airflow through the nose, which may have a secondary impact upon the ability to smell um, and may cause some secondary problems with sinus drainage if it's particularly marked. Um, of course, some people may have an underlying sort of problem already that they didn't necessarily realise and, and say a head injury may be therefore an exacerbating factor on, on a background situation. So why do we lose the sense of smell um, with head injury? Um, well, it may be because there's bruising of the brain. So um, we can talk about uh, sort of direct trauma. So that there may be um, severity of injury enough to kind of cause, say, a fracture of the, um, the, the frontal bones of the forehead and direct injury to the, the brain there. Um, what's most common is what we call contra-coup, uh, which means that the sort of when you have a blow to the back of the head, the front of the brain sort of bounces off the skull. Uh, and that sort of bouncing mechanism causes bruising and uh, perhaps bleeding within the brain or the, or the lining of the brain. Uh, and that can cause um, an impact upon the, the, uh, the nerve tissue. And one of the things that often gets talked about and, and often gets explained to people is that the, the reason that they lose smell is um, uh, severance of the olfactory nerve fibres. And the olfactory nerve fibres are like sort of fine filaments um, going through the base of the skull. Um, and if you've ever seen a, a picture of the inside of the skull, you can see, you can see this fine little pepper pot appearance to a structure called the cribriform plate, which is the area of bone that sits above the top of the nose. And in medieval times, it was thought that that pepper pot sort of uh, configuration was uh, to filter out the bad humours uh, from our brains. So that's sort of why we had this little pepper pot appearance. And it was only later that uh, people realised that actually these uh, pepper pot holes were to allow the fine um, smell nerves to pass through the um, base of the skull into structures called the olfactory bulbs, which are sort of uh, the relay stations for, um, for, the, for the smell pathway. Um, so, so those can be sort of stretched and, and potentially severed again with a sort of forwards and backwards movement of the brain, and that will de depend on the severity of injury. Um, now, this comes on to sort of assessment, and I'll, I'll, so I'll come back to these points a bit further on. Um, Obviously, as I mentioned, you can get injuries to the nose itself, which may cause a problem and, and pre-existing uh, problems within the nose may, may be a factor as well. So this is the issue with uh, why nasal injury is important, as you can see here on the diagram. Uh, and for those of you who can't see the diagram, then uh, what the diagram is showing is a sort of inside picture of the nose uh, as we look at it head on and you can sort of visualize inside of the nose there and those, those bits that are looking crooked are um, uh, fractured bits of the nasal septum as a consequence of injury and they're bowing across to one side of the nose and as we only actually get 15% of the air we breathe in through the nose to the very top of the nose to smell if you then have a, a, a sort of bend in the septum or a fracture that sort of diverts further airflow away down to the bottom part of the nose you can imagine that that 15% gets even lower um, so the nasal injury is an important bit to consider if, if it has happened um, and uh, to address. And obviously this is uh, something that can be potentially corrected surgically if it does happen. So this is the bit about the um, sort of uh, the, the level of injury. So this diagram here is, is sort of looking inside on like a sort of cut through the, uh, um, the head. Um, and at the bottom of the picture, you can see the nasal cavity. Um, <clears throat> and at the very top, you can see the, the little sort of um, beginnings of the nerve fibers and they pass through um, this line here, which is the, the, the bone of the skull base. 
and this little round sort of oval structure above that is called the olfactory bulb. And so the nerve, nerve fibers pass through normally to the bulb. They go backwards down this line here, which is the olfactory tract. And then they actually end up back around in this area of the brain directly above it. So they kind of go on off in a long loop and connect to other areas and come back again. <clears throat> so you can see here, you might get um, uh, sort of shearing of these fibers with enough force. Um, you might get direct bruising to this, the brain here as it, as it sort of bounces off the skull. And in the right hand picture, you can see that if you if you the trauma directly to the face is bad enough to cause a fracture of these bones, it may potentially penetrate directly into this area of the brain. I have to say that um, <clears throat> in a UK setting with seat belts, um, certainly certainly um, in my practice, I don't see a lot of this sort of direct trauma. I see a lot more of this in indirect trauma, if you like. So. Um, uh, on the picture on the right here, you can see an example of an MRI scan. Um, and the MRI scan is, is, uh, stands for magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, for those of you who've ever had one done, you basically lie in this sort of big donut and the, the magnet spins around your head and creates pictures by um, putting the molecules in, in uh, different directions to create a picture. And there are, there are two settings, two, roughly two speaking, two settings on that. Um, and we use what we call a T2 setting. And that highlights sort of fat and water. Um, and it, it tends to show up bright areas that have sort of been damaged in the brain. So you can see at the front here, these areas are showing up sort of white. And that's indicative of um, a sort of a change in the nerve tissue called gliosis, which indicates sort of bruising and scarring of the brain, which has probably occurred due to trauma. So uh, the MRI scan is a sort of critical bit of, of how we um, assess and look at the, the area of injury. Um, so we may see area directly to the, the brain at the front here, which is where we, uh, one of the key areas where we receive smell. But there are other areas where um, smell is involved, such as the temporal lobes, which are these bits at the side of the head here, um, the amygdala, which is a bit more centrally here, um, and the um, olfactory bulbs, which we saw on the last picture. So, uh, as I say, the severity of trauma is, is a key bit to this, and, and there's a sort of classification system which grades um, uh, brain injury into sort of um, degrees of, uh, of trauma or severity of trauma, uh, and that's traumatic brain injury one, grade one, grade two, grade three. So a grade one is a sort of milder injury, and you can see that smell loss is associated um, with 18% of those cases, where it becomes more severe in grades two and three and that over half the people are affected by smell loss. So, you know, the severity of, of the mechanism of injury is really a key part to that. This also ties in with the sort of the ability to recover. And I guess, again, the more milder the injury, the more likelihood of recovery. And you can see the graph on the right here depicting a sort of, um, uh, the, the sort of clinically significant degree of improvement. So the early, uh, the, the three six month period is where a lot of um, potential improvement can occur. Certainly up to a year, there's still chance for recovery. Um, getting beyond 12 months, there is still some recovery possible, um, but over 24 months becomes much less likely. Um, certainly over a 12 month, sorry, over a, over a 10 year period, there is evidence of, 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 of a smaller numbers of cases recovering, but it's that first 24 months is more critical. So um, when I see patients in clinic, I will um, talk to them about the onset and timing. And one of the things I often sort of face when meeting people um, that come in is that they may actually have a number of things that, are, that may be potentially um, sort of uh, precipitating causes. So they may say, well, I've had smell loss for a couple of years and I remember falling over at the time and, and banging my head a bit, but I wasn't knocked out. And they also think I had a cold near the time and um, and, and there was, I, I had a new tablet I started on. So there may be a few things there. And so one of the things that I often find myself doing is really just trying to sort of weed out um, the time relationship between any of those events and the onset of the um, smell and taste disorders if possible. Um, and, and then if, if, if that's not easy to do then so going through a process through examination and through investigation of then trying to work out what the most likely causes. Um, and so head injury may be there, but it, it may be that it turns out that the head injury is, is less relevant in the circumstances, um, depending on the history that's given. Um, obviously it's important for me to find out from people whether they have other symptoms from their nose, um, <clears throat> um, particularly if they've had injury directly to the nose, so can they um, breathe less well through the nose than they did before? 
indicating they may have a bend in the nasal septum. Um, if they get sort of discharge, mucky discharge or um, facial pressure, perhaps they've they've had a bend in the septum and it set up some secondary problems with the sinuses. So they, that may be other indicative signs. Um, I like to talk to people about uh, whether they've experienced um, distortions of smell. Um, so most commonly people may experience phantosmia, which is the sort of um, getting a sense that uh, there's a smell there without there actually being a smell present. And often people would describe um, those things being there all the time and they kind of move around and they can still smell smoke even though they know no one's smoking outside the window. Um, smoke and petrol are the most common sort of uh, phantosmia descriptions that I hear from people, but you know, there's, a, there's a range of things that people experience. Um, important to, to explore taste with people. Um, and I think uh, Tom was explaining to you this as I, as I tuned in, the difference between um, flavor perception, which is contributed to through retronasal olfaction, which is this process of smelling what we eat, and actual true taste, which is the uh, salt, sweet, sour, and uh, bitter and savory sensations we get from the tongue. And again, that may be relevant here because if you've had an injury to the brain itself, then it's possible if it's been bad enough you, that you may not just have injured the smell um, area of the brain, but also what we call the gustatory center of the brain, the taste area of the brain. And so you may have both smell and taste disturbance. And, uh, you know, I do see this from time to time. And that only really comes out through doing testing. Um, Obviously uh, important for us to elicit any other sort of um, relevant factors in the medical history and surgical history, which may have an overlay or may be relevant to the circumstances, um, particularly any medications. Um, perhaps a medication has been started after uh, an admission for a head injury um, for another reason. And it may be that the head injury itself didn't cause a problem, but the medication they started on whilst in hospital has actually been the, the key factor. So again, something else for us to think about. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is, is to explore people's expectations for um, what they're hoping to achieve uh, through the exploration of the issue. So in terms of investigation, uh, very important for me as a clinician to look inside the nose and to, to establish whether the nose looks normal inside, um, whether the septum is straight and whether there's no signs of any um, swelling there that could indicate other issues going on, because those things are potentially correctable and treatable from my point of view very, very instantly. I say instantly, I mean, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a kind of clear sort of route forward for, for managing those. Um, if I suspect that someone has problems with their sinuses, so for instance, then I may well um, request what we call a CT scan to look at the sinuses in more detail. Um, and I will do that on the back of the basis of the history and examination. However, if I look inside the nose and everything looks normal and you know, the history is very straightforward, then I will certainly move on to um, doing an MRI scan. Um, and occasionally I may need to look at doing some blood tests if there's any uncertainty about things. But the most crucial thing is to do the uh, smell and possibly the taste testing to get an establishment of a baseline ability. Um, and people often sort of, um, uh, assume that you know they come in and say they can't smell them naturally they, they can't smell but you know the reality is we find that there's a often a mismatch between how people sort of perceive their sense of smell and taste and how they actually perform on testing so the test we use in the um, smell and taste clinic is known as the sniffing sticks um, originated in germany for sort of over 20 years ago now uh, and it contains um, three parts of the test so the first two parts are done with a blindfold on and um, the bit on the right of the picture uh, with the red tabs is called the threshold test. And basically what we do is we establish a level or a depth uh, for one um, odor, uh, how easily people can detect it. And so we start from the smallest concentration and we basically work up until they um, either detect the level and they can pick it up or that they don't get any correct answers at all. <clears throat> and they get a, um, a minimum score of one for that test. Um, uh, and with the test, there are two blank pens and one pen that contains a smell. So they have to pick the odd one out. So they have, to, they have to identify which pen is the one that smells compared to the two blanks. And the second part of the test, we do discrimination. So here, all three pens smell, but one is different from the other two. So we're asking people to pick the odd one out. And then we do this for 16 sets of, uh, uh, of uh, three odors. And the last part of the test with the blindfold off is uh, called identification. And so on the screen of the computer, the uh, 
um, a patient will see four choices and they'll smell each pen and then they'll have to pick one of the four choices. Um, this process of having to have, have a choice every time is something that um, people often feel a little confused about. It's an international standard, uh, we call alternative force choice method of um, testing smell. Um, it's a similar process to um, perhaps those you might have done a hearing test, you have to sort of uh, press in, in response to sort of stimuli. Um, so we ask people to give a response. Now, people may say, well, I can't get anything at all. Why do I have to give a response if I can't get anything at all? The reason is actually because when you get some people whose sense of smell is a little reduced and they're close to where that is, actually well, by making them focus in, they will actually start to kind of pick up um, where things are at. Um, and the test it has obviously has an error margin built in. So that we know that if you, even if you guess a, a quarter of the, uh, the uh, uh, answers, um, you're still not going to get enough of the score to be considered um, having a normal sense of smell. So that is built into the test and it's an international standard. And that's basically the sort of result you get from the test when we, when we print out the result at the end of it. And this is um, me when I had uh, acute sinusitis. So you can see I had a, um, a reduced threshold so you didn't quite get down into the, the smaller concentrations. I um, got 11 out of 16 of my discrimination and I correct, correctly identified 10 out of 16 uh, of the odors in the identification test. Um, the other bits that we, uh, we may choose to employ depending on the, on the circumstances of the individual patient um, <clears throat> on the right is the, is the standard taste test. These are just strips. Um, and you can see here a little picture of me with uh, Jane, our research nurse, um, placing one on my tongue. So it's very simple that uh, there are 32 strips, um, well, I'll say 16 strips, um, four for each of the four taste modalities of salt, sweet, sour, and bitter. Uh, and for each of those four taste modalities, there are four concentrations. Um, and so we'll ultimately test each side of the tongue and go through a random sequence of all those different concentrations for each of the four modalities. And so there'll be a, a maximum score of 32, uh, minimum score of zero. And, and uh, again, people will have to pick uh, a choice from one of the four options of salt, sweet, sour, and bitter for each of the presentations. On the left, we have a, a specific test that we, we do very occasionally for people who feel there's a mismatch between um, when they smell stuff on the outside and, and their perception of flavor of food. This is called a retronasal test. So we place powders on the tongue, but we're really asking them to identify the smells. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's a sort of um, a choice of four options. So as we place each one on, you have to kind of work out which of those four smells it is. And in this circumstance, we're not testing salt, sweet, sour, bitter. We're, we're getting the, <clears throat> the smell of what that food powder is. So as I mentioned, this, um, uh, illustration really shows why it's so important we do testing. The graph on the left shows um, a pie chart indicating people presenting to a smell and taste clinic and what they complain of. So you can see the biggest um, part of the pie chart here is smell and taste loss, nearly 60% of people, 20% um, of people saying smell loss only, 10% um, complaining of distortions of smell or taste, and 8% saying taste loss only. Here we come over to what we actually see on testing. So um, <clears throat> nearly 70% uh, have only smell loss. 28% um, have a normal sense of smell and taste. And only 1% have a true taste loss. So you can see that all these people over here were saying they lost their sense of taste. Actually, in reality, only, well, usually less than 1% actually have true taste loss. And that's because of this um, sort of uh, lack of sort of understanding of the true taste and, and what we perceive as flavor when we're eating food. Uh, yeah, so smell training, uh, someone's mentioned this already. So um, uh, this is obviously a very simple self-directed uh, intervention um, with increasing evidence for its benefit. And uh, it has been shown very specifically to help in patients after head injury. Um, and for those who are not familiar with it, the idea is that you train with sort of four odors twice a day uh, by sniffing out of them from uh, from jars or bottles. Um, there's plenty of detail on the Pissons website about uh, the process of doing that. And um, the original, people often stick to these original sort of four odors that, that have been used in the studies, but these are not prescriptive. And um, the key thing I would say is that the important thing is that you pick four smells that you remember or are familiar with before your um, in injury. Um, and that they're things that are in liquid form that can go in a jar so that they have a sort of creative vapor space in the jar. <clears throat> 
Um, so you could take things off the supermarket shelf. I don't know, for instance, vanilla essence. Can you put a bit of that in a jar and be able to smell that? It's, so anything in liquid form is, is good for that. And so aromatherapy shops are often a, a sort of good place to sort of start for these type of things. So you can see that um, uh, compared to um, a group of patients uh, who do nothing at all, people with smell training over time uh, can take themselves from having no sense of smell to having uh, some reduced sense of smell. So they can now start to improve things. Um, and so the minimum time period for this is, you know, at least at least three months of training. Uh, but the more recent evidence shows that um, by then changing the odors you train with every three months and continuing that, that on for longer periods, there's even an enhanced uh, potential for greater recovery. Um, so this is the um, page on the Fissense website, the Smellability Toolbox, where you can find a lot of this sort of information um, and how to go about this in your own time at home. And uh, you know, if there are any questions about this, uh, please do you know, contact the Fissense office. Um, just to say on the practical support, um, these sessions that we're doing, do keep an eye out for them because uh, smell training is going to be a very regular part of that. And we've got two different approaches, either through using uh, essential oils, very potent smells, which can be a very fantastic regular process, but also uh, looking at how is it that we can really bring together the power of memory in with smells which would be very familiar as well. So two different sessions, we're going to have a whole program on that for next year. Do keep an eye out. Sorry, Carl. How, how can this help? Yeah. So, yeah, so um, one of the uh, sort of uh, features that we can see that, to suggest that the chance of improvement with uh, smell training is that um, uh, the patients uh, younger have a shorter duration of, of uh, the smell loss and less severe trauma. So those, these things we kind of touched upon before. Um, things going against that, obviously, um, when we do the MRI scan and we see um, damage in the frontal lobes, particularly if it's on both sides, that, that's the sort of, uh, a poorer sort of uh, chance of recovery in those circumstances. Um, other things to think about in terms of managing the situation are um, sort of dealing with the sort of aftermath of it. So um, thinking about sort of domestic adaptations and hazards and also workplace adjustments. So um, thinking about, you know, what are the hazards to you in the home environment if you can't smell um, and does it require an adjustment at work if, you, if your sense of smell is critical to the work you do um, and you're potentially exposed to some hazards through work? Uh, so important that these things should be discussed with um, colleagues, line managers, etc. cetera. Um, diet obviously is a key one because we see a lot of people who um, uh, will either, or well, two thirds of people will, uh, will have a weight disturbance. They'll either gain weight or lose weight. Some people will lose interest in food. Uh, some people will um, go for food that provides stimulation and actually put on weight. Um, but it's only about a third of people that manage to maintain a steady weight despite the smell loss. Um, obviously, people have a lot of concerns around personal hygiene, so important to just sort of, you know, keep that in mind. Um, uh, just sort of uh, you know, have a sort of good schedule for um, personal hygiene and also just remembering to talk to friends and family about it so that uh, um, they're aware that you're unable to kind of pick up on those cues. Um, this is an excerpt from a book called Navigating Smell and Taste Disorders by um, a colleague called Ron Devere, who's a neurologist in the States, and his co-author, uh, Marjorie Calvert, who's actually sort of um, uh, uh, does a lot of uh, the uh, sort of catering in his facility, and they got together and basically wrote something around uh, um, some suggestions around dietary advice and enhancements to food that could be made to try and improve um, palatability. And you can see here for a number of things on the left, some suggestions of spice combinations that may actually improve uh, appreciation of um, the, uh, the food itself when eaten. What about um, distortions of smell? Uh, well, as I mentioned, these are common and uh, head injury is I guess the second most common group after um, uh, viral um, causes. Um, there are some simple things that can be tried at home, <coughs> uh, such as uh, trying to increase uh, sort of pressure for the valsalva maneuver. If you ever tried to pop your ears and pinch your nose and try and pop your ears, that's called the valsalva maneuver. Uh, head movements, um, stimulating those other smells, obviously, is the smell training um, aspect. Um, nasal rinsing can help in a few people. Um, deep breathing in through the nose, uh, and also things that stimulate what we call the trigeminal nerve. So the effect you get from uh, horseradish or mustard. <clears throat> 
Um, the sort of tingling of the uh, trigeminal nerve pathways. Uh, what do I do if faced with um, people presenting with these qualitative disturbances? Um, well, uh, this is a more generic slide around sort of all causes of smell loss. And, and um, again, a lot of this will depend on the timing that they present. Um, but if I feel that the uh, distortion of smell or the, the, the phantosm, if it's imagining smells, is the predominant feature, um, then I would talk to people about some managing that um, head on specifically. And one of the key medications we often use for that is gabapentin, which can be quite effective. Um, but there are some alternatives to that if, if that isn't helpful. Uh, I have never resor resorted to surgery, although there is um, uh, a colleague in the States who reported a, uh, a case series of stripping out the uh, smell lining uh, for people who felt so disabled by the smell distortions that they wanted to eliminate the sense of smell altogether. Obviously, that's quite a radical step and uh, not something I've ever uh, had a conversation with going any further with, with any patients. About one in three people may get some partial recovery, um, but um, complete recovery only cares about 10 to 15 percent, 10 to 15 percent of patients after head injury and that most likely time frame for that is within two years. Um, and it, it's the kind of baseline sort of degree of function at testing which is probably the most significant factor. So for me, that's why doing a smell test for people when they come into the clinic to get an idea of where they're starting is, is, is often really crucial. Mm. Um, one of the things that uh, allows us kind of, uh, to look at recovery is, is this structure called the olfactory bulb. And, and when you do MRI scans, you can actually see the size of the bulbs and that gives you a sort of indicative overall performance because the bulb tends to get bigger when things are working better and get smaller when things are not working so well. So it, it can actually increase and decrease in size uh, um, adaptively. So the sense of smell is what we call plastic. It can actually sort of uh, recover even, even after childhood, unlike our other senses, which uh, tend to have this thing that there's a, if there's a hit to them early on in life, they can't, um, they can't sort of recover from there. So our, our sense of smell is, is better in that respect. Um, and the olfactory bulb is a way of sort of, uh, sort of assessing that. So, yeah, so I think in summary, obviously, there are a number of mechanisms of injury. So it's, it's important that those are um, evaluated and the site of injury is, is clearly understood in an individual case. Um, obviously, uh, having youth on your side is, is a, has a better prognosis for um, uh, outcomes, as does a lower mechanism of injury. Um, and, you know, treatment options that can be applied will depend on the severity of injury. Uh, and again, where I find an absence of, uh, of findings in someone who presents early, we may talk about things like trying steroids, uh, which has some ev limited evidence to support it. Um, and there are one or two other medications which have in non-randomized controlled trial settings have shown potential benefits. So um, in people who present early, there are a few things that potentially could be explored. It's, so it's getting people to come in early and, and present with these um, head injury uh, problems early uh, is that it's most helpful to us as clinicians. Thank you.